All right. Hi, welcome. Um, I am Jenny Guyford. I am a teacher in Corona Norco Unified. And I'm here to talk to you guys about um, math stations and standard base grading. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen with you. Oh, I need sharing permissions. All right. For some reason, I can't. Oh, I, uh, Mr. Lopez, are you able to disable your or give me sharing rights? Let me check just a sec. Okay. Um, I need to reach out to our other friend for that. So let me stop recording now just to see if that has any issue to do with it. And then we'll check back in. Um, or unless Lisa, uh, could you make her a co-host? She doesn't have sharing oh. rights. Oh, okay. See, we're this is the first time I've done this virtually. Yeah, um, it's okay. It's okay. You we're are a team co-host. You are a professor for the Masters in Instructional Technology for National University, and as you can see, I do quite a few things for National University, and then I'm also a secondary induction coach for Riverside County Office of Ed. So um, keeping myself pretty busy these days, that's for sure. So if you want to contact me at any time, uh, this is my email and my Twitter handle. And up in the left-hand corner is the bit.ly uh, link to this presentation. And I know Mr. Lopez will drop it in the chat box for you guys as well. All right, so one of the reasons I started this journey into math stations and standard best grading was I realized very quickly as an educator that I was not servicing all my students. Uh, a lot of my students were being um, held back because of difficulties, especially with math. And when you look at a traditional uh, setting, you run into issues where you're teaching to the middle. You're not teaching to the high, you're not teaching to the low, you're teaching to the middle. And so that's what really got this going. So how do you reach all your learners? I mean, really, how do you, and how do you even grade them? Like, what's that look like? And so it took me about a year to research all this and to interview other educators to find out some good answers to those questions. So in order to really reach students and their needs for all those learners, I had to make basically individualized plans for all of them, which sounds like an enormous amount of work. And when I first heard that as a teacher, I was like, ah, oh. <laughs> I have 250 students. There's no way that's going to work. Um, so I started to investigate and research, like I said, and I came up with some easy ways to do this. So first thing I did was I created lessons at their personal learning ability. So if they're operating, I teach seventh and eighth. So if they're operating at a fifth grade level, what I would do is look at the learning progression standard that we have. So if I'm looking at a seventh grade standard, I'm gonna find where that standard would relate to a fifth grade math ability and then work them up. So they're still working at a, on a seventh grade standard, but at a fifth grade level. So you kind of have to tweak your standards and unpack those standards a little bit more precisely. And it does take a little bit of time, but once you get the hang of it, you just kind of honestly, you'll just look at it and go, oh yeah, okay, I got this. And sometimes they're almost the exact same. Um, provide every student with equal opportunity to grow and strengthen their academic uh, um, abilities. So everybody gets a chance to raise their grade. Everybody gets a chance to try to improve. And then this will also create lessons that are diverse, inclusive, and measurable. Okay, so how do you achieve all this every day, every year? Like, what does this look like? And I'm going to tell you, your first year is going to be your learning year. It's going to be your, you know, trial by error year. And then after that, it goes easy. So I spent my first year really doubting <laughs> I had this right. And then when I did it the second year, I was like, oh, all right. And I just kind of used the same uh, philosophy and all the stuff that I already had going. So it was great. So math stations literally saved me from insanity. Um, developing math stations, I was able to use data to provide each student with the support that they need. At the same time, 
I am not creating individual lessons per se for every student, but I'm using technology to help me to provide that support. So at some of the stations, the students would be on a, a, a device or working with friends. And because I put them in stations homogeneously, I can work a whole group that seems to be at that same deficit or also need that same challenge and provide them that individualized instruction versus a traditional setting where I stand at the whiteboard and I direct teach to the middle, and then I expect everybody to understand it at the same level. So that wasn't working for me. I was getting lots of Fs. I was getting kids who didn't really, you know, want to come to school. I mean, you, you, your standard teenager who's like, this is the same thing. And that system's not working for them. Obviously, that system hasn't worked for them because they're not doing very well or they're behind. So by giving them a system that can work for them, I had kids who were excited to come to math class after this. I had kids with better attendance and better scores because they got to see that their own progress was actually leading them somewhere. So the best part is none of the students know that they're getting different lessons because it all looks the same. And a lot of times it's because they're at a station with kids who are also getting that lesson because they're all at the same level. So even if they were to ask their buddy next to them, hey, how'd you do number five on the computer? The kid's like, oh, I did this, this, and this. And it started that conversation, and which was great. So to get started, the first thing I do is I take all of my students and I pre-assess them. The pre-assessment, I use something fun like quizzes or Quizlet or Kahoot, something fun. Now they are taking this completely blind. They are not exposed to this at all prior unless they learned it in the previous year. And that allows me really quickly to see what I need to teach. So instead of teaching the whole unit from start to finish, I'm only teaching the parts that they need. And again, some kids will need the whole unit and some kids maybe only need three out of the five substandards. So when I look at a standard and I make a quick little quizlet or quiz, I take a standard, I unpack it. This is a challenge question. This is a middle question. And this would be a low question. All right. And then if I have kids missing all the low questions, yep, I'm going to put them together in a group. If I have kids missing all the middle, those are my middle group. And if I have kids who are acing the entire thing, now you're my challenge group. So let's say they're in seventh grade. Now I'm giving them the progression of that seventh grade standard in an eighth grade format, challenging them to the next grade level. So they're not sitting there bored and then getting antsy and then getting disruptive. They are engaged and they're learning. And I've even had some of my high students turn and look at me and go, dang, this is hard because they've never had to try before. They've never been asked to try, you know, but at the same time, I have my, my friends on the lower spectrum learning this at a pace that they can understand. Okay. And they're not going to do the entire unit. They don't, I'm not going to kill them that way by going, okay, these guys only have to do three of the five lessons. You're going to do all five. No, they might only have three of the five lessons. I'm going to pick out the essential learnings of that lesson and I'm just going to hit them hard with it. And just, we're going to keep practicing it, but we're going to practice it in different ways, which is the stations. So the kids, as they rotate through stations, they're exposed to those lessons in different formats. Some might be concrete, some are representational and some are abstract, your, your typical CRA model. All right, so I, um, and I, the kids don't even know what group they're in because I don't, I just, you're in the red group, you're in the blue group. And then the next week I'll change it. So if the, if they do start to get kind of smart and go, you know, that, that red group seems to be um, a group I never seem to leave. <laughs> am I, uh, am I one of the, the students that she's worried about? So the next group, oh, you're green. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a color of me just being able to make sure that those students are being serviced. So here's kind of what this station looks like. And this is what a quick little drawing I came up with one day to um, explain to another fellow teacher I work with what I was doing. Now I have five stations, but what, I, what I'm focusing in on are teacher led stations. So I am a station. So I will see all of my groups. I'll see my high and my middles and my, and my low friends. And it's a small instruction. So for the first time I get to sit and give that immediate feedback as they're working which is crucial 
to all groups. All groups need that. My high students, they need to know, hey, awesome, you did that right, but why do you think the answer came out to that? And I'm giving them those probing questions that create that thinking process. My, my lower students, I'm giving them the support, I'm giving them the manipulatives. And it's funny, when I actually get out a lot of the manipulatives for my, um, my lower friends, the higher kids are like, can we play with those too? <laughs> And so I bring them out for them too. And they're like, this is fun, you know, because they think it's a toy, but the other kids, they really did need it. I also have offline stations and my offline stations are stations that are going to be working with collaborative group activities. I do things like breakout EDU. Um, I do Robert Kaplinsky's open middle stuff. Um, I do spiral review. Hey, that's a station that my low friends, I don't care if they're working on a fifth grade activity. Let them work on that fifth grade activity. Go for it. Okay. So because to me, it's practice and it's filling in the gaps that they desperately need filled in on. And again, because they're sitting homogeneously, they are not intimidated by the one person in the group who's trying to take over or the one person in the group who's telling them the answer. They're all operating at the same level. So those conversations are all at the same um, level, you know, like just comfortability with each other. And then I have my online stations. And this typically is more independent, even though they sit as a group. It, you'll see here, I have a couple pictures of my actual classroom pre-COVID. Um, where the kids sat with their laptops and uh, it's self-paced. They go at their own pace. It's um, immediate feedback um, programs that I use. And all I do is assign it to them through Google Classroom. So before we even went to um, the COVID schedules, I, um, my class was 98% online anyways. The only 2% was those offline stations where I made worksheets. But I could easily put those worksheets into an online station. I just wanted them to be able to handwrite and and be able to, um, you know, collaborate without a laptop in front of them. I don't want them to always feel like they're stuck at a computer. So the first thing I would do is that pre-assessment. Again, you want to get that data. You want to find out where your kids are. Do you need to teach the whole unit to everybody? Or do you just need to teach a couple parts of that unit? They got everything else. Don't teach them stuff they already know, but that doesn't mean don't teach it at all. You want to spiral it in there just to make sure it wasn't a, a fluke that they happen to get that answer right. So as you work with them in groups, hand them a couple questions like that and see if they can still give you the correct answer. So this is my actual classroom uh, again before we went off for COVID. Um, this is a station and you'll see the kids come to a station. They have a folder. This is an off, this was actually my teacher station as you can see. So as they're working and they'll get the wipe, the expo markers and they'll write on the tables or I'll walk right next to them and I'll do the work on the table with them. And then they erase it. I mean, the tables are very glossy. And then they, they talk to each other. But this particular one, I had given them the example, as you can see, it's actually written there in black and I worked it out for them. And then they were practicing on their own. So I'm standing there, but while they're practicing, that's my time I turn and monitor my other stations. I turn and make sure like, okay, all my stations are doing what they need to do. I answer questions at those stations if I need to. And then I circle back to the station. So I'm not sitting, I'm standing, I'm walking around this table. As you can see, there's four people in my group and that's a perfect size, but that immediate feedback is so key. I would say if you're doing this, try not to have groups larger than six because then it just becomes very hard to answer those questions individually. Here's a collaborative group. So this is an offline group. The kids were working on um, data charting and um, they are talking to each other. You can see a lot of times they'll get up out of their seats. Now, if you see in the back of the room there, I also, um, follow Ed Campos and I, he's a buddy of mine. I'm actually wearing his little Q Tang shirt today to give him a little shout out. He does a big thing on 360 math. So those are whiteboards behind them. My room is covered in whiteboards. So you'll see the kids jump up. They'll start working stuff out on the whiteboard. You can kind of see it over there in the corner there. Um, but they'll, that's how they collaborate. So as they're talking, they are supposed to be up there. And if one of the team members gets up and starts writing on the board, they are to respect that student like a teacher and turn and look. 
So it's not just the one kid who's, you know, up there talking to himself. So very supportive tasks. And this again is going to be based on how they performed on that pre-assessment. And then I have my PBL project group where I have students working in projects um, either on online or offline. I have several sites that I like to use. And typically these are gonna be challenge groups um, with a DOK of a three or four. You know, those things that we never really get to. We, we tend to stick around in the DOK one and two levels. Very rarely as educators, do we have time to get to a three or four? So use technology to help you. Now for this particular thing, all of my students get this one. This one is not differentiated. It is to increase higher order thinking for all my learners. So every group gets this exact same project. And it's funny because like I said, they don't know they're getting something different a lot of times when they're at the other groups. But when they do see that they're getting the same thing to everybody, then they don't even question the other groups. They just assume, yeah, okay, everything looks the same. It's, if it's on the computer, it's the same program. So the format's the same. If it's offline, it's the same sort of paper assignment. So unless you're gonna sit there and do a side-by-side -side comparison, the kids don't know, okay? But this one, they do work together. And it's so funny that they will sit there and, um, you know, that math discussion is amazing. They're just like, no, 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 no. You have to do it this way. I, I, I'll show you, I'll show you. I never had that in 20 years as an educator where kids sat there and debated about math. I just never thought that would happen. So using that collaborative technology piece, things I use are like self-assessments, breakout EDUs, they love those. Um, they also love doing uh, drag and drops, um, Kahoot games things like that, anything that kind of spiral reviews and et cetera. The cool thing about technology is a lot of these sites will grade it for you. So honestly, my grading went from like insane grading all the time, tons of papers to I'm grading the stuff at the teacher station. And guess what? I'm grading it as I work with them. So before they leave, they're all getting an A because they did it along with me. I know they got the A, or, well, I'm gonna talk to you here in the standards-based grading here. I know they already got the, the mastery on that assignment. So I don't really need to grade it, it's already graded. So they turn it into me, they get the points. The rest of all this is practice. And that's one thing I'm gonna talk to you about when I get to the standards-based portion of this um, presentation, is with practice, you don't grade it, it's practice. So make it fun, make it exciting for them, okay? Now, if you wanna issue some points to it, you can, because a lot of these technology um, uh, sites and you know uh, websites that I use, they grade it for you, which is nice. And again, back with the technology review, so. All right, so what do I do after rotation? So what, I, what my classroom looks like is I have seven periods a day and we're only 45 minutes a period. So there's no way the kids are doing more than one station. So every day they come in, it's a different station. So I have a day set aside for pre-assessment. I look at that data that night, and then the next day, they're automatically assigned a station rotation. So they come in and they go, oh, I'm on the green group this week, and I have their names on the, under the green section or the, under the red section or under blue, whatever you wanna do. They find their name, they find their color, and they report to that station. And once they get trained on this, oh my gosh, it's seamless. The kids walk in, they get right to work. They just know what to do. They get in, they have a folder at their station that tells them their directions of what they're going to do. Now, every day at the end of the day, after the kids have gone home, I pull out all those stations and I swap them out with the group that's going to be there for the next day. Again, that individual group. So, oh, my high group was at station one. Well, my low group's going to be at station one tomorrow. They're definitely not doing that assignment. And I put in the assignment that they're going to do. Now, if it's a technology assignment, it'll just be the instruction sheet. Log on to this, work on this assignment, work collaboratively, you're done, okay? So that's kind of how that works. Now, after the kids go through, let's say all five stations or four, a lot of teachers like to do four. I did five because I wanted smaller groups. I didn't want groups that be larger than six people. And I had 42 in each class. So I tried to make them a little smaller. And um, so after they do all five, we do a catch-up day. 
Now that's a day for the kids who didn't finish an assignment at a station. The, the group didn't get a chance to finish and they need a day. So we'll call it catch up day. And I have a big catch up bottle that I put on the whiteboard and the kids think it's hilarious. They're like, ah, oh, it's catch up day. And they go to the station that they need to finish. And that's it. Or they grab the laptop and sit at their desk. They can still work with their peers. They can still ask questions. If it's a teacher station, I make myself available. Um, if they're all caught up, those students are working on the unit review. So before we take the unit assessment, they're going to work on that unit review. And then that's about it. But they, they go through their notes, they annotate, they highlight, they redo any assignments. They do an error analysis assessment or assignment. They love those. So it's kind of like I spy things. And then we assess. And the assessment is truly to tell me if my stations were valuable enough to reach that level of mastery. And if I see that the students did not reach level of mastery, then I know we need to review that standard again, or we need to look over that. But we're at this point, we're about seven days in and I've done a whole unit. Okay, so it goes really fast. So I do have extra time now to reteach, which is something we didn't have before. We don't have time to reteach. But if I can condense a unit down into seven to eight days, I now have time to go back and reteach before we take a formal assessment. So again, you reevaluate that data. You look at it, you see if you need to develop new stations or is it something I can just cover um, in you know, a couple days that reteach, uh, give that spiral support to all those students to help them give to that mastery level. So now let's talk about standards-based grading. Now, this was something that was new and dear to my heart because I did not appreciate the traditional grading scale. And for a lot of the reasons I'm gonna discuss with you now, Standards base really takes the unbiased out of grading. It takes the subjective, okay? As we know, I could give a student an A and my fellow coworker give, could possibly give that student a C because we grade on different objectives. We're looking for different things. It shouldn't be that way. It should be a, a uniform way of grading. If the kid earned an A in my class, they should definitely be earning an A in that class. But we come to find out that teachers like to grade things differently. They, they add in behavior, they add in missing assignments, they add in all these things that can bring the student's grade down, okay? So let's kind of talk about that. It is difficult to wrap your head around this, but it will make you realize very quickly that sometimes you're what you would consider a lower student and a D or an F student, could actually be a B or a C student, you just may have been grading them wrong, okay? And that's kind of hard to understand. So the first thing I always want to point out is the integrity behind the grade. Get your biases out of the way. And this comes down to that equality um, and equity piece that you hear a lot said in education, okay? So if you're looking at the left column, those tend to be things that teachers will knock a student's grade down for, or they consider part of the academic grade. Behavior, okay? They're always turning assignments in late. They have missing assignments. Those are behaviors, all right? And teachers tend to mark them down. No, instead of missing assignments, what are they learning? What have they turned in that demonstrates mastery? All right, you need to change it to that. Not quantity of work. Oh, you got, you got all 10 of the 10 assignments in, you get the A. No. What if they only turned in five of the 10 assignments, but the five that they turned in are at mastery? That's quality work. The journey going through the unit, okay? We don't want kids just to go through the unit. We want them to have a destination. That destination is to have that mastery, to understand how to do that standard independently without support individual preference versus common agreement short-term compliance i don't want them to learn this for just enough to get past the test i want them to learn this where they can carry it on to the next grade level they're only going to do that with a mastery level and i'll let you read the rest of those but that's what we're looking at okay so the cycle kind of looks like this you start off with your teaching. The teacher focuses on the instruction for that standard. Of course, right? That's basic teaching. Students learn skills to meet the standard. Uh-huh. 
students complete tasks to assess if they met the standards. Very good. And then you have teacher indicates for each assessed standard if it's met or not met. It's a yes or no. It's not an A, B, C, D, F. It's yes or no. All right, if the student has not mastered, any child who gets the not met goes into that subcategory there where you see teacher identifies knowledge gaps, reteaches those standards, um, students complete more skill-based um, activities, and then we start the cycle over again. Now, what about the students who did meet? You have something different for them, okay? You have them working on um, a unit review. You have them annotating their notes. You have them finding an error analysis. You have them doing another um, technology activity or another PBL. They're not just sitting there doing nothing, but it gives you the time to work with that small group that you saw did not meet the standard. So traditional grading system versus standards-based grading. One thing with traditional is um, oftentimes one grade will be given per assessment, all right? So every time the kids assess on something, there's a grade put in the grade book. Yeah, we've all done that, all right? With standards-based, you're looking at their learning goal. So if the learning goal is to reach mastery, that means that grade can be swapped out. So there's one assessment grade, that can revolvely change as they go through the unit. So let's say on the very first assessment, your first little quiz, they scored a one, which is a D or an F, okay? And you're like, okay, you don't keep that one. When they do the next assessment, if now they're showing you that they're at a three, you take that one off the grade book and you put in a three. It's where they are currently and academically. All right, assessments in a traditional setting tend to use a percentage system, 90%, 80%, 60%. All right, with standards-based, you're gonna have proficiency level, which is far above mastery, at mastery, below mastery, far below mastery, okay? Uh, traditional settings, you're gonna use um, an uncertain mix of assessment, achievement, effort, and behavior for the grade. So you're looking at assessments, work completion, homework, how much effort they put into it, are they turning these assignments in on time, and their behavior, okay? If you're looking at um, standards-based grading, you're looking at achievement only. All right, everything goes in the grade book with a traditional setting, and that's where my grading was insane. Okay, I was grading everything that they did. And I, I, I was just up all night with, um, I think I actually did the math calculations one, <laughs> one week. And it came out that I was grading about 3000 papers a week. And it, I, I was consumed. So you don't have to put everything in the grade book, okay? With standards base, you're doing selected assessments, test quizzes and projects. Everything else is practice. We learn, and fail through practice. And I always give my students the um, scenario of learning how to ride a bike. So the first time you ride a bike, you're wibbly, you're wobbly, you're unsure, and then you fall down. All right, well, in math, that's kind of how it happens sometimes. You're, you're wibbly, you're wobbly, you're unsure, and then you fail. Well, if we just walked away the first time we fell off a bike, none of us would be bike riders. Let's just be honest. Okay, I don't know many people who pick up a bike and take off and that was their first experience. But you get the bike back up and you knew wibble and you wobble a little bit, but now you learned a skill like, oh, I learned that if I kind of hold my hands this way, I'm actually have a little bit more balance. They're learning skills as they go. And then they reach mastery. So would you tell someone who is a triathlon, um, you know, person that their bike riding scales are um, failures because they fell the first time. No, you're going to look at that person and go, man, you are way above master. You know how to ride that bike better than anybody. Okay. It's achievement. Um, and then of course, um, with traditional, you're always looking at the average. Our, a lot of our grade book systems, especially now the computer grade book systems will average the grade. You don't want that. You want the most recent evidence. So again, they, a lot of those grades can change. You have points versus standards-based grading. With traditional, we tend to give points. Um, like, oh, that's a nine out of 10, that's an eight out of 10, things like that. With standards-based, again, you're looking for achievement. 
So remember I talked to you, it's all about unpacking that standard. All right, so you have your domain, okay? Your grade level domain. And then under your domain, if you're ever looking at the state standards, there'll be like 1A and 1B and 2B and that kind of thing, all right? So if you have that going on, those are your substandards. Those are your umbrella standards. And then you take it and you break it into your pieces of evidence here. All right, so that's how you assess. So when I look at my evidence down at the bottom, those are my pre-assessment questions right there. Is once I get to that level, I'm looking, those are my pre-assessment questions. And a lot of times you can look up online if you're, you know, I don't make these questions up myself. I take too long. I look up online um, questions that, you know, go with this standard. Oh my gosh, Google will give you tons. Okay, so once you know this process, you're golden. And this is actually a process I teach to my student teachers through National University. And when I work with them in the credential program, one of the biggest assignments we give them is how to unpack a standard. And I've realized that even a lot of teachers in the teaching world today have never been asked to do this. Um, so it's something new for a lot of people, but my student teachers, this is how they realize if they're creating a rubric correctly, you don't want to make your rubric based off the domain. Your rubric needs to be based off the evidence level. Okay, so things like that, it does help to wrap your head around it. All right. And here, you, um, this is kind of just looking at that, you know, mastery class material and how we look at behavior. Now, when you look at behavior, again, you don't want behavior to be a academic grade. Them failing to turn in an assignment should not result in them getting an F in class. If that kid can do, I, I even have this, to be honest, I even have this rule with my kids. I'll let you skip every assignment in my class. All right. And the kids look at me like, what? I'm like, because you have those kids who are super smart, but they're really lazy. <laughs> okay. Let's just be honest. And you can't get that kid to do anything to save your life. And why sit there and fight with them? It's not worth your energy. So I'll look at the king. I'll make you a deal. And the kid looks at me like, oh gosh, here it comes again. She's going to give me some kind of reward if I turn in my work. No, 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 dude. You can just come to class, participate with your group, help your group members out, but you don't have to turn anything in. And they look at me like, why? Because when we take that assessment, baby, you better ace it. Because if you don't ace it, that tells me you do need support. You do need to learn the lesson. And now you're going to turn the work in. And I've had kids who can ace every single assessment. They're in my highest group. They're doing the, the challenge work with their peers and they ace every assessment. That child's at mastery. Now a traditional teacher would give that kid a C. I give him an A plus. He knows his math. That's, my, that's what I'm grading on. I'm grading math. I'm a math teacher. Okay, we're not looking, I'm not a behavior teacher. There's nowhere in a math standard that says must be turned in by midnight the night before. No, it doesn't say that. Okay, so I don't grade on stuff that's not in the standard. Now his participation grade is probably an N. <laughs> Needs improvement. Unless he is really participating with his group and he's doing that part of the deal. If I see him helping other members, then he gets, a, he gets an O. A piece of paper does not show me he understands what he's doing. The assessment shows me he understands. All right, so you have this breakout here. All right, so standards-based grading looks like this. You have a direct correlation between specific vocabulary and numeric value. All right, so a one is a beginning person. That kid's beginning to learn the lesson. Think of it that way, all right? Two, they're progressing. Three, they're at mastery. They are at seventh grade mastery. Now a four is far and beyond mastery. And what does a four mean? A four means that they can do it independently. They don't need your help. They never ask questions and they're acing it every time. That's a four kid. I'm gonna tell you, be honest, you probably have very limited fours. You'll have more threes, some twos, and I hope you have very few ones, okay? Because even when you pre-assess, you're gonna find that the kids have at least been exposed to it a couple times, all right? You have targeted instruction from your standards. You have multiple attempts so the kids can redo assignments. They can redo that quiz. 
And then they can focus on um, understanding versus completion. So if you gave 10 assignments and the kid just is like, you know, especially your SPED kids or your ELL kids where it's going to take them a little longer. Look, I'm going to give you the five. All right. If you can get five of them in, you got your full mastery level. I can, I can tell by five lessons that where you are in your mastery. All right. 10 would be great. But again, I'm not grading on completion. I'm grading on quality. Now, if they turn in those five and they bomb all five, then we might need to do the 10. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Okay. So when you have a standards-based grading, you're kind of looking here. You learn a skill, you practice, you make mistakes. We all do. Even if I take a college course today, I can guarantee you I'm going to make mistakes, right? We all do. You analyze your mistakes. That's a gift you have to teach children how to do. Because they make mistakes and their brain goes, I suck. And they stop right there. You got to teach them, where did you make your mistake? How can you fix it? All right, let's quiz you on that skill now. Oh, you made some more mistakes. Okay, let's ask for help. And you can kind of see how this goes through. And by the time they're done, you have a mastery level. So standards implement in planning, um, how you plan this all out. And again, I've kind of gone over this a few times, but this gives you a little Venn diagram. You identify the standards, you find the acceptable evidence. Remember the evidence? Okay, determine if the uh, learning experiences can be enabled and students can learn and what they need to do, so forth. Now, formative assessments. So in um, standards-based grading, you have two different types of assessments. You have formative and you have informative, okay? Informative is what they're pretty much doing in class where you can walk around and see like, oh, okay, all right, they're getting this, they're getting this. A formative is your, you're looking for mastery, okay? It's not a done grade. It, um, it does see how effective your teaching was. It's gonna see how effective those standards, uh, those stations were. It does see where your students are in their learning and where you need to go next. That's the purpose of a formative assessment. If you get a bunch of kids coming back at mastery, you rocked. You got it. Does that mean all your kids? No, no, but a good amount. So here's your traditional grading scale, as we all know. The problem with this one is that last box. If you notice everything's going down by nine, right? That last one goes down by a lot, 58 points. That's crazy, or you know, 59, if you think of it that way. Okay, this is a huge deficit down here. If a kid gets an F, their grade's going whoa, real fast. And you know how hard it is to get him out of that hole is very hard. Zero is a killer, okay? There's lots of research around this, and this was one thing I researched heavily, that zero is undeserved and devastating, affects the student's grade and their ability to understand and show mastery. So much that no matter what that student does, that zero distorts the final grade. And if you're giving the kid a zero because they turned it in three days late, wow, think about that. That's you're, you're just shoot the kid in the foot. That's awful, okay? This is something that's gotta go. It's gotta go, friends, okay? Now I had some teachers go, well, my lowest grade's a 50. But does your 50 count as a zero? What's its worth? Is it worth 50? Or are you weighing it at a zero? So you still have to look at how you weigh these things out, all right? So let's look here at two different students. We have student A with a punishment and student A, or no punishment, excuse me, and student, this student over here does have a punishment. So they both got 100% on their quiz. Woohoo, rock on. All right, this one here has no penalty. The student says um, the quiz, they missed it for a doctor's appointment, extracurricular activities, blah, 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 blah. This one says student, uh, teacher says the student cannot make up the work because um, it needs to be done in a timely manner. They had a hard deadline and by George, they're sticking to it. All right, well, quiz three, so that's quiz two. This student got a zero, as you see right here, got a zero, this student did not. They basically got a bypass, all right? Quiz three, they both got a 75. Quiz four, they both got an 80. So everything they earned the exact same grade, but look at their final grade in the class. Student A, first column, is at a B if we're looking at a traditional scale, right? 
The other one with the punishment is a D. Would you say that student is working at a D level in math when they can give you a 100, a 75, and an 80? That kid's not a D student. So that's how we're hurting these kids. All right, now if you look here, we can look at other grades going straight across and you can see how they all average to 79. All these kids get a C. All right, would you say, let's see, this student number six and number seven, should they be getting a C in the class? 98, 98, 99, 100. Oh, but they got a zero. They deserve a C. What if this was your own child? Tell me you wouldn't be talking to that, that teacher real fast. Whoa, 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 my kid could teach this course and you're giving my kid a C? Think about it. Look at the unfair justice here we have, okay? And a lot of this is emotional grading. Teachers are grading with your emotions, not their standards. They're looking, well, you didn't get that in on time and I'm taking 10% off each day that you're late. Whoa, whoa, holy cow. And I have teachers who will debate with me every year when in conferences and they'll say, well, when I'm late on my bills, I get penalized. Yes, but you're an adult. <laughs> These are kids, they're learning. Why are we punishing kids? We want them to learn. They'll get that when they start paying bills, they'll figure that out, they're smart. So we're not setting them up for how to pay their bills. We're setting them up to how to get a job. All right, here's some different types of grades with standards base. Uh, typically people make a four um, above mastery, far above mastery. Again, four, can do it, can teach it. They never ask you a question. They're acing it every time. That's not a kid you worry about. That's your challenge group kid. They're off on their own. And here, this one does have a zero, but look, that zero is only a three point deficit. Three points versus 58, huge difference. All right, so again, here's another way of looking at it. Again, when you start using the words beginning, emerging, developing, proficient, advanced, big changer. You know what I stopped doing? I stopped putting this on their papers. I stopped putting ABC on their papers. You know what I put? Advanced, proficient. I even had self-stamping stamps. <laughs> Because I got tired of writing all that every time. <laughs> that and I kept spelling one of the words wrong every time. I'm a math teacher. But I got those made as self-stamps at like Kinko's or whatever. And I would just pop it on their paper. You're at a beginning level. Hey, you're at a beginning level. That's okay. You're beginning. Dude, you're developing. I love it. You're lo And the kids were like, hey, okay. But when they see an F or they see a D on their paper, what do they do? What would you do? We shut down. Oh, man, I suck. Yeah, nothing new. I'm always getting F's in math. And they instantly tune out on you and they don't want to be in your class anymore. All right, I know I'm coming up on time. Another thing a lot of teachers will use are these words, exceeds expectations. Ooh, oh, doesn't that sound nice? Meets expectations, those kinds of things. These are the words I use in parent conferences. I never tell a parent their kid's getting an A. They can see on the grading thing they get an A. I'm telling your child exceeds my expectations. That parent just went, really? Wow, that's kind of cool. All right. Now, if I have a child who's really not doing well, I'm going to say, I, I have nothing to really assess because they're, they're, what they're showing me is there's no response. They're not turning anything in. There's so many errors. I don't even know where to assess them. So these are some things you want to maybe take into consideration. And you, one thing you'll learn is with standards-based grading, there's a million different scales out there. You just pick the one that works best for you. You use the word verbiage that works best for you. But ultimately, it's all the same box. Okay. I have um, a side-by-side -side here. You can see again with your um, some different grading percentages where this one here, um, an A minus ends at a 93.49, and but a four goes all the way down to an 89.49. So if a student scores a four, that means they can do it independently. Will they make mistakes? Of course they're gonna make mistakes. It, it's not 100%, it's between this percentage group or between this bracket. You could even look over here and see this breakdown. Okay, this was a, a friend of mine, Mrs. L's grading scale. Okay, again, you're going to come up with your own grading scale. Here's a five point grading scale because a lot of people don't like that zero. Okay, this one's mine. <laughs> this is the one I use. 
I do have a zero. My zero means, friend, you gave me nothing. I have nothing. Okay, so I have nothing to assess. All right. So uh, if it's missing, that's different. I don't put a zero in for missing. I just leave that box blank in my grade scale. But I go up to that student and say, can you turn in something? If you turn it in and at least give me some try, you get a one. At least try. All right. And again, I know I'm coming up on time and I want to maybe answer some questions. This bit.ly is on there. People ask me all the time, how do you grade citizenship then? How do you grade the behavior? Here's my rubric. All right, this is how I associate an OSN grade. All right, and all this is in the deck. You can see, um, I actually wanna show you my, there's my grade book. That's my grade book. I color coded it because I'm crazy. But that, that tells me right away, woo, this kid right here with all these reds, I need to talk to that friend. Okay, this is how I can look very quickly who is working at Mastery. Now look here, these are my standards. It's not an assignment, those are my standards. Okay, and this goes on forever, but um, I'll let you guys just read through that because this is typically a presentation I give in about an hour. So um, I'll let you guys kind of read, but hopefully that got the juices going and maybe you want to research a little bit more into it and um, find out some ideas. If you have any questions, you can always email me and I'll be more than happy to help you get set up or help you get some ideas going on how to do either the stations or let's say you don't wanna do both. You're like, I'm not crazy. I don't wanna do both. I don't wanna transform my room into stations and grade differently. Um, if you wanna just try one or the other, let me know. But I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so Mr. Lopez can take it over if he needs to. But are there any questions, Mr. Lopez, that I missed in the chat box? No, you did wonderful. Everyone. Oh, okay. Awesome. All right. Well, does anybody have any questions now before I, I know we have to get going for you guys can get